five minutes and uh, leave our pastor a little time. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. Hallelujah. What a great, great time we are having today and uh, talking about this mixed multitude that went up also with them. They were not part of the children of Israel or else they'd have already been mentioned in this group that came out. 600,000 but these are a different group of people these are not the children of God and yet they came out of Egypt with the children of God we have no idea how many there were but we do know it was a multitude multitudes tend to be a large number and so there are more than just the children of God who've come out of Egypt and who were these people who was this mixed multitude that had come out Mixed gives us an idea that it was perhaps a mongrel people, perhaps half-breeds or quarters or who knows what all they were as far as their lineage was concerned, but they were not of the Hebrews. They were not that group, a mongrel, a, a combination of peoples, or perhaps they were pure-blooded of whatever they were, but there were many different types and kinds of bloods that came out. We're not sure who it is. Perhaps they were interested followers. Perhaps they were just many mixed peoples, like I have said. Hangers on to God's people. People perhaps that had made friends with the Hebrews. We don't know. Perhaps they were fortune seekers. I mean, the Israelites, before they left Egypt, had had taken the gold and the jewelry of, of all, not stolen it, but asked the, the heap, asked the Egyptians and said, we're, we're about to leave. Uh, could you give me some of your gold and your silver, your jewels? And they gave it to them. Perhaps they were fortune seekers. We don't know. Curiosity seekers. Well, I've been watching these people all my life. They're different than any of us. And, and uh, the, now we're, I, I think I'll throw my lot in with them. Perhaps they were miracle seekers. After all, they had witnessed some tremendous things so far. They were there when the plagues came. They heard about Moses telling Pharaoh what was happening, what was coming. It was noised abroad among all the people that were there. Yeah, the water is going to turn to blood. <laughs> likely, likely story. And then the water turns to blood. It's going to be a plague of flies. And then, lo and behold, there's a plague of flies. And on down it went through the ten plagues that were there. And they, they saw the miracles that were being done and being proclaimed by Moses beforehand. And then actually done. And then finally Moses said, okay, we'll stop it. And it stops. Perhaps they were interested in following Moses. I mean, anybody who has that much power. You know, I'd, I'd rather follow after these people. They have a leader that, that's got some power. And I, you know, all Pharaoh has is swords. Maybe we'll follow them. Maybe it was people who were curious and just wanted to follow them out into the wilderness where they said they were going to go and sacrifice to their God. And so we want to go and see what kind of sacrifice it'll be. And maybe we'll see the glorious God of the Hebrews. We don't know what they were. Perhaps it was an unthinking mob of slaves from many nations. The Hebrews weren't the only slaves that Egypt had. So perhaps it was other slaves that worked with the Hebrews as they worked as slaves under the rule of Pharaoh and his minions. They thought this is our chance to escape. We'll throw ourselves in with this lot of Hebrews. Whatever it was, whether it was them seeking their chance of freedom, whether it was just curiosity seekers, whether it was people that had, had come because, man, you know, I, I can seek my fortune with these people. I don't know. But whatever it was, they made a good choice. You can stay in Egypt, which has been decimated by the plagues, or you can go with the people who avoided all the plagues. Who would you choose? Would you stay in Egypt or would you follow after this group of people that say their God is doing this and that he can do anything? So they made a good choice. All of them.
of them did. They attached themselves to a rising star, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, that God was going to use and God was going to bless. And they said, we can be around and get some of the blessings. It was a good choice. But what happened to them? They had a chance to become Jews. They had a chance through what's called a proselyte process. They could become Jews. And some of them did. Many of them didn't. Many of them were satisfied just to be around the Jews. But they were not interested in becoming Jews. Interesting to me. So they made a good choice to follow and go with the Jews. But many of them were satisfied being around them. They could have become Jews, but they did not. Why not? Well, I'd have become a Jew, but there are just way too many rules and restrictions. I'd have become one of them, but man, they live such a different lifestyle than anything I'd want to live. There are too many thou shalt nots. I don't think I could live that way. I oh, man, and not only that, but there are too many thou shalt. Too many things they're expected to do and expected to be. They talk about being the servants of God. I've been a servant of Pharaoh's for way too long. I don't want to sign up for any more servants, see? I don't want to become anybody else's servant. Who knows what the reason for those of the mixed multitude that were just satisfied being around God's blessed people and not becoming one of God's blessed people. Servants of God? Never. You know, we, there can be a mixed multitude in the church. As a matter of fact, every one of us in here was part of a mixed multitude. Hallelujah. How many of you are thankful? How many of you are thankful that when Jesus died, he said it's for whosoever will. Whosoever will, let him come. He didn't say, well, now, as long as you're Jews, you can come. He didn't say, as long as you're good looking, you can come. As long as you are rich, you can come. He didn't give any restrictions. Whosoever will. And every one of us is in that category. And if you went down through every one of our lineages, if you found out who we were, we are a mixed multitude. Hallelujah. The United States is a melting pot of the world. We have a, we're, we're all in this country a mixed multitude. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I'm thankful he didn't put any restrictions on it. Praise God. We were a mixed multitude. Now we are the children of God. Everybody say child of God. That's who you are. That's who you are. Praise God. That's who you want to be if you are not yet. So in the church, we were all mixed multitudes. And but many of us have become children of God. But some may be still part of the mixed multitude. The Bible talks about becoming part of the people of God. It talks about seeking him with the whole heart. Following after him with the whole heart. It gives us a... Some examples in Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. To be part of the family of God, there is this wholeheartedness that has to be there. A wholeheartedness, a seeking of God that needs to be there. Psalm 34, verse 10 says, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing seeking the lord not just seeking to be part, you know among them or around them but seeking the lord not just to be around the church not just to be able to say well you know i go to that church but to be able to say i am a child of god praise god jesus is my daddy hallelujah hallelujah i, I love the fact that he is my father hallelujah i never called my dad father I might have referred to him to other people as that's my father but when I talked to, that, to my dad it was always dad before that it was daddy hallelujah 
and he's my daddy, Jesus is. Hallelujah. But young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. That is what God has for us. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. Ye shall seek me and shall find me. You'll seek him and find him when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Hallelujah. This living for God is living for God. It's no longer living for me. It's no longer me living for me. I, that's the way it was before I became a child of God. It was me living for me. But now it's me living for God. Search for him with all your heart and you will find him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. In Acts chapter 17 verse 27. It says, they that should seek the Lord, if that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Hallelujah. And finally, turning to Jeremiah chapter 29. This is the New International Version. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. And not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope. And a future. Praise God. Then you will call upon me. And come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me. With all your heart. Hallelujah. We can stand around and be a mixed multitude if we want. We can be those that would hang around the church. Or we can be those who earnestly seek God hallelujah. hallelujah there's a song that I think the children used to sing this years ago from dear to gear I'm not sure now I'm not going to try to sing sing it but it says at the completion of the golden gate no angels no angels did not celebrate and when the Wright brothers flew their bird no angelic shouts were heard there's only one thing that we're sure about that can make those angels jump and shout it's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice that's when the angels rejoice now when the light bulb first lit up the town no the angels did not dance around and when a man stepped on the moon they did not sing a victory tune there's only one thing that we know about that makes the angels jump and shout it's when a sinner makes the Lord his choice that's when the angels rejoice I think there ought to be some angelic Hallelujah. celebrations going on today so I ask you this what are you afraid of what are you afraid of there is a God who welcomes you there is a God who's looking for you to touch him with all your heart seek him with everything you have and he says I have plans for you praise God Pastor. praise God Hallelujah. Hey, sir. Well, that was great. I thank the Lord that God makes that call to every one of us today. And what I have to say is going to dovetail with that. So I would like to read from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, and verse 39. And along going on with the same message, really, is part two. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And just for a few moments, I want to speak to you on this subject. I lost it all to find everything. I lost it all to find everything. Would you lift your voices and your hands to the Lord? And would you give the Lord Jesus a praise that comes from your heart? Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, God. You are the great God. You are the mighty God. Hallelujah. God bless you. you may be seated. And last night, I came into the house of God to pray. And the crowd was very small. The storm had taken its toll. And I guess there were lots of things going on. But suddenly the presence of the Lord just came into this place last night. And those who were here can testify that 
the presence of God just begin to fill this house and we all begin to weep and praise and worship the Lord because we can feel his presence. I don't know what it means to you to be able to feel the presence of God. But I would ask you to think about this. Never take the presence of God for granted. Never just assume that God is going to be there no matter what. Yes, he will be there for you. But always be thankful and aware. Now Jesus made a statement that at first reading, it looks like it's contradictory. It looks like what Brother Stevens would call a paradox. He said, he that findeth his life shall lose it. That seems contradictory. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. It is ingrained in our human nature, is it not, to look out for number one. Now, it's true. Everybody in this world is, is looking out for number one. Always trying to take care of themselves. If it's going to be, we say, it's up to me. I can't just wait for the elevator. I've got to climb the stairs. Often the first consideration is, in many ventures, what's in this for me? What is this going to do for me? And then the next thing that comes to your mind when you're considering a particular action will probably, probably be this phrase, what will this cost me? We're inclined to go after what we want, are we not? It's just a fact of life. We're inclined to make it happen. But when it comes to living for God, when it comes to living for God, the mindset of aggressively achieving our dreams, our desires, our wishes, our will, no matter the cost, that philosophy absolutely does not work. For Jesus said, and he reminded us all of a law that is irrefutable. It is absolute. He said, he that findeth his life shall lose it. Jesus was telling us that if your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. If your first goal is to take care of me, then you will not be taken care of. You'll never find real peace. You'll never find real joy if your first concern is to look after yourself. Human nature, as you know from infancy, says, I want what is mine and I want what is yours too. All you have to do is visit the nursery and you can figure that one out. A child can be happily playing with their toy until they see another child playing with another toy and then they want their toy and the other child's toy also. And will be very grieved if you do not allow them to take that other toy away from the other child because after all, what's in it for me? The human nature says. Wow. We are so afraid. Now this is all humans, okay? We're so afraid we're going to miss out on something. Somebody else is going to get a better deal. Somebody else is not going to have to pay the same price. Or somebody else is going to get a better bargain. Oh, if you want to know if that's true or not, just go out to some store on some major shopping day when they've run this big discount on this special toy. And how many times have we read about people getting into fist fights? over a particular toy because they wanted to get the best deal. And we're so afraid we're going to miss out on something. We've got to make sure that we don't end up on the short end of the stick. But then we take a look at this book. This book has so much wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 24, listen to what the book says. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tends to poverty. 
The word of God is telling us that there is that the, they, they, the, they, they scatter, they, they give of themselves, and yet they increase. And there is those who withhold more than they should, and they're very tight, and they're very tight. That's a good word. They're very consumed with self. It destroys every relationship that they're a part of. Anybody who's married to somebody who has to have it their way all the time knows that that's a difficult life to live. And you know, the people that you like to be around are people who are actually interested in you. How many has been in a conversation with somebody that you started to say something and they just kept talking and they talked about their this and my this and, and uh, my kids and my, 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 my. And, and pretty soon you just said, um, <clears throat> have a nice day. Huh? It's the most boring conversation in the world. It's all one-sided. But how many knows what it's like to be around somebody who looks you in the eye, actually, when they shake your hand? And they're listening to what you're saying. Now, I have to admit that men have a harder time with this, perhaps, than women do. Listening. Is that correct? Never mind, never mind. Don't want to hear it. But the Word of God says there is that scattereth and yet increaseth. It's a paradox. It's, it seems contradictory. They're giving of themselves and yet they're increasing. And there is those who withhold more than they should and they try to pull everything to them and yet they, they end up in poverty. So the Word of God is telling us, let go. Let go. Don't worry. God will increase you. Don't get involved with some kind of a, a race with the Joneses. Uh, who can have the best and the brightest and who's got the most intelligent kids and who's got the smartest and all that nasty stuff. The Word of God says don't withhold yourself. In, the, in matter of fact, here's what the Word of God says to do. Forget about yourself and look to Jesus. You'll find both yourself and Jesus. When you forget about yourself, and you know, half the troubles that we have many times are feeling slighted because somebody didn't listen to us, somebody didn't do it our way, somebody didn't give us our way, somebody gave us uh, the, the short end of the deal, uh, they didn't have to do this, and I had to. All just kindergarten stuff. Kindergarten stuff. Maybe pre-kindergarten stuff. Because when we forget about, our, about ourselves, and we say, God, I give all myself to you. I'm not afraid. You know, I... Am around people all the time who are afraid to give Christ their all because they still got this old mentality. Preacher, what's in this for me? What's this going to cost me? What will I have to do if I give Christ my all? Not realizing that when they give themselves completely to Christ, the best days of their life are straight ahead. Not realizing that when they trust Christ with their all, and they don't just say it, but they do it, and they're willing to let God have all their life, that the best days of their life are straight ahead. Right. Because there is that with scattereth and gives, and, and yet gets ahead. And there are those who will say, I'm, I'm just, I just can't make that dedication to God, because if I did, it might cost me something, and they end up in poverty. Huh. A very famous man said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Right. Now, I'm not going to ever stand and make fun of people who are 
begging with the cardboard signs. But there is something that I think you need to know for yourself. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging. Is it safe to give her all to Christ? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Matter of fact, I absolutely know that it is. And then there's another scripture in, Ma in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Look at this on the board with me. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he, Jesus, said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What? If anybody's going to follow me, he says, the first thing I want you to do is deny yourself. It's the same thing the, the other scriptures are saying. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Well, I thought Jesus took up the cross. He did. How many knows what it's talking about when it talks about taking up your cross? You see, everybody's barns burn down. All of us have tragedies. Those are not crosses. Those are burdens. A cross is a sacrifice that you choose to make. A burden is a sacrifice that was shoved onto you. You had no choice. And none of us get to choose those things. We don't get to choose when we're sick. And we don't get to choose when bad things are going to happen. Those are burdens. But he said, whosoever will follow me. He said, let him deny himself. And take up his cross. Now, a cross is a sacrifice that you choose to make for Jesus. It's not something that somebody's standing over your head and going, Okay, Grace Sidelinger. You either live for Jesus, I'm going to blow your head off. Well, I surrender. Right? That's not a cross. A cross is when you have the opportunity to make a sacrifice for Christ that you might even choose not to make, but it's your choice. And that's why it's called a cross, because you get to choose whether or not you will make that sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And I tell you that the word of God says, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. There it is. There's that paradox again. There's that contradictory seeming statement that Jesus makes it again. He says, for whosoever will save his life. You want to save your life? He says, lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So if you're going to go like this and you're going to say this is mine and this is mine and, and that's mine and, and I'm not giving up anything I don't have to and what's the least I can do and be saved and I'm just going to walk this line here between living for God and living in the world. I'm just going to walk this, this, this line. You're going to have a very miserable existence. But when you say God here I am Lock, stock, and barrel. Here I am, Lord. I give all myself to you. I promise you, those are the happiest days of your life. Right. And then verse 36 says this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So if you... If you used all your talents and you built a financial kingdom, but you couldn't go to church and you couldn't pray and you couldn't serve the Lord in order to do it, what did you accomplish? If, if you helped so many, many people all around you and lost your soul in doing so, what is that going to profit you? It's kind of like riding on that commercial jet and the, the, uh, the attendant 
gets up, the flight attendant says, in case of uh, loss of cabin pressure, uh, this oxygen mask will drop from the ceiling. Uh, secure your mask first and then help uh, anyone else around you. But make sure you put yours on first. Why is that? Because what does it profit you if you try helping other people and you kill yourself doing so? People who spend all kinds of time helping other people and do not pray. I don't understand that. Who spend all kinds of time doing good things for, for lots and lots of people, but don't take of their own soul. That doesn't make sense to me. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world, lose his own soul? Well, I got this little neat story I want to share with you and a song. Is that okay? Thank you for your wonderful response. Maybe I should go over and teach the children this morning. <laughs> this was on CBS News a few years ago, and I'm just going to give you the story as I read it. Between classes, they schemed and conspired. For weeks, the football players at Olivet Middle School in Olivet, Michigan, secretly planned their remarkable play. Everyone was in on it, says Nick Jungle. But the coaches didn't know anything about it, Parker Smith says. We were like going behind their back. Now remember that these are middle school kids. We've never heard of a team coming up with a plan to not score. It's just like to make someone's day, make someone's week, just make them happy, Justice Miller says. The play which was two plays actually, happened at a home game earlier this month. The first part of their plan was to try to get as close to the goal line as possible without scoring. Even if it meant taking a dive on the one yard line, which it did. The crowd, as you can imagine, was not happy. But us kids knew, hey, we got this. This is our time. This is Keith's time Parker the quarterback says Keith Orr is a little kid in the brown he's the little kid in the brown jacket he's learning disabled struggles with boundaries but in the very sweetest way possible because of his special nature it's no surprise that Keith embraces his fellow football players what is surprising is how they have embraced him we thought it would be cool to do something for him, Parker says, because we really wanted to prove that he was part of our team and he meant a lot to us, adds Nick. Nothing can really explain getting a touchdown when you've never had one before, says Justice. Which brings us to part two of their play. If you didn't see Keith, it's because they were so protective of him. But he was in the middle of that one yard rush. When they crossed the goal line, Keith says, it was awesome. It was like, did he just score a touchdown? Keith's mom, Carrie says, get your camera out. His dad, Jim, Jim remembers saying, Keith's parents almost missed the moment, but they got the significance. Somebody is always going to have his back. From now until the day he graduates, Carrie says. She's right. When the football team decides you're cool, pretty much everyone follows suit. Today, Keith is a new kid. Although by no means was he the only one who was profoundly changed. Once I saw him go in, I was smiling up to here, says Justice, a wide receiver, pointing to his cheeks. Nothing could wipe that smile off my face. Ask why it affected him so much. Just, justice turns emotional. Because he's never been cool or popular. And he went from being like pretty much a nobody to making everyone's day. Justice admits the play wasn't his idea saying, I would have not really thought of that. He says it never crossed his mind to give Keith any glory. I kind of went from being somebody who mostly cared about myself 
and my friends to caring about everyone and trying to make everyone's day and everyone's life, he says. Which may just make that touchdown the most successful football play of all time. Now I have a song, if this works. Never sung this song before. Let's see what happens.
died a pauper to become a king. When I learned how to lose, then I learned how to win. Oh, I lost it all. To find everything. Anybody understand what this song is saying? I lost it all to find everything. I became a pauper to become a king. Then I found out how to win Oh, I lost it all To find everything Oh, I lost it all To find everything I just feel the Lord's presence here right now. And I want to thank Him right now for giving us the opportunity today to say, God, not my will, but Thy will be done. Lord, not what I want, but what You want. I give it all to You right now. Here I am, Jesus. Help me to trust You enough that I can leave it all with You. That I can lay my whole life in your hands and not be afraid of what I'm going to miss. Lord, it's the enemy that wants me to doubt you. It's the enemy that wants me to be afraid of making a total dedication to you. But I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Father, I give all myself to you today. Does anybody feel something? I feel a warmth right here. The presence of the Lord is in this house. I am saying to somebody in this building... Let go and let God. Don't worry about things. Just let go of it and let God. Give it all to Him. Somebody said, I can't afford it. No, you can't afford not to. Give it all to God and let God give you all His. I had to lose it all to find everything. Now, would you bow your heads with me this morning? I appreciate so much the, the wonderful presence of the Lord and Brother Joseph, are you still in here? Come up here and help me, please. I'm so thankful today that I can trust him. And the reason some folks are struggling today is because you're so afraid to trust the Lord. But I promise you, he will never fail you. And I don't know if you've heard that song before. Watch out, that's on... Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't want to mess you up here, but there we go. Okay. Key of C, Brother Joe. I lost it all. loves you so much you are his little child and if you would please everybody close your eyes and just tip your head back to father and hold your hand up just a bit if you wouldn't mind and I want you to say these words if you mean them father I trust you I trust you with 
my life. I don't always understand. I can't even pretend to understand. But I'm turning it all over to you right now. I'm giving it all to you because it's too heavy for me, Papa. I lost it all to find everything. that that's just your old nature and that's just the devil because Papa will never take advantage of you never never and when I learned how to lose I found out how to win oh I lost it all to find every of the Lord is calling you right now if you'd like to come and pray this morning I'm going to open up this altar right now somebody that God's been talking to in this entire message both the first and the second halves about making that complete dedication to God and not being afraid to do it Father is here in such a wonderful way. I feel his presence so strongly right now. Would you like for him to come to you right now like a white tornado and clean out all the stuff that needs to be cleaned out? And Would you like to say, Father, I've tried to do it my way, but now I want to do it your way. I give it all to you right now, Lord. I died a pauper to become a king. Everyone in this building, I'd like to invite you to come and join us. And let's pray together. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day to pray, folks. I lost it all to find everything. Everything. 